Hello and welcome back to Linear Algebra. This is part 26 in the series and we still talk about the basis of a vector space. More precisely, today we want to lie the groundwork to define the dimension of such a subspace. However, before we start with that, I really want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, via PayPal or by other means. And please don't forget to test your knowledge with the quiz and the PDF version of this video with the link in the description. Ok, then let's start with the topic of today, which is Steinitz exchange lemma. This one, as I mentioned before, is needed to define the notion dimension of a subspace. There you might already have the correct intuition, which means a plane should have the dimension 2. This is the case because you would say we only need two vectors to span the whole subspace. Or more precisely, the number of vectors in a basis is exactly 2. Moreover, on the other hand, a line needs only one basis vector and therefore it should have dimension 1. And in the same sense, we would talk about higher dimensional spaces where we need more basis vectors. So you see, this sounds like a reasonable definition for subspaces. However, you already know that for a given subspace, there is no unique basis. Please recall, we have already seen examples where we can choose different bases that do the same job. Therefore, what we now have to show is that different bases still have the same number of elements inside. So in other words, the number of basis vectors inside a given basis is well defined. And in order to show this, we need Steinitz exchange lemma. And this is what we prove today. Ok, so the first step of today is that we formulate this statement here. There we start with the usual linear subspace U in Rn. So you know, it's a subset of Rn that conserves the linear structure of the vector space. Moreover, now we also assume that we have a fixed basis B of our subspace U. The basis elements in the basis B we call just V1, V2 until Vk. Ok, so you see, we have a fixed subspace and a given basis of U. And now what we do is that we add new vectors in a family we call A. And the elements inside we simply call lowercase a1, a2 and so on and the last element is a l. And here the important thing is these elements come from u and are linearly independent. So now we have different vectors besides our basis vectors. And the only thing you have to note here is that we have l of them. Ok, and now Steinig's exchange lemma tells us that we can form a new basis with this A by using some vectors in B. Indeed, the numbers of vectors we have to add is given by K minus L. And as I said before, if we do this, if we add these vectors, we get a new basis of our subspace U. In fact, this is already the whole claim, we can construct a new basis. It's called the exchange lemma because some vectors from the old basis are exchanged by new vectors. Ok, then for the rest of the video I would say I give you the idea how to prove this statement here. So formally what you can do here is a proof by induction. And in order to give you the idea how to do this proof I show you the case that L is equal to 1 in all details. Indeed, the idea here is that we just form the union with B and A. Of course, when I write a union for families, I just mean the extended family here. In other words, we first have the V vectors and then the A vectors. And in our case here, we just have one A vector. And the first fact we can conclude here is that this new family here is linearly dependent. And we should immediately see this because B is already a basis of our subspace U. This means our vector A1 can be written as a linear combination of the basis vectors. So we find uniquely given coefficients lambda1 to lambda k such that A1 is equal to lambda1 times V1 and so on. Hence you see A1 can be spanned by our k basis vectors here. And of course, this immediately means that our family here is clearly linearly dependent. 
Moreover, we know that the family A is linearly independent, which means A1 is not equal to the zero vector. So we can conclude that not all the coefficients are equal to zero. Therefore, let's choose a lambda j, which is not equal to zero. And this now means we can divide by these coefficients on both sides. And therefore, we can bring the vector vj to the left hand side. And then we also get a linear combination for this vector. If we write it down, it looks a little bit more complicated than before, but essentially it's the same length as before, because we omitted the jth entry here and we subtracted a1 here. Okay, now by having this linear combination, we know we can drop vj from the family here without losing any information. Or more precisely, what we want to get is the linear independence now. And for this, let's call the new family we get here C. In fact, what we now can show is that this new family C is a basis for our subspace U as well. Therefore, let's first show that we have the linear independence. For this, let's choose an arbitrary linear combination with all the vectors with coefficients lambda tilde. Moreover, here you see, for convenience reasons, we have put the vector a1 at the position j. Okay, and now you know, for showing the linear independence, we want a linear combination for the zero vector. Okay, then the first thing to note here is that this lambda j tilde has to be zero. Because if it wasn't zero, we would be able to divide by it. Hence, we would conclude that we have a new linear combination for a1. However, now without the vector vj. And this can't be because the linear combination from above was uniquely given. Hence, we could say this contradicts the statement from above. Essentially, what you should see here is that the vector vj was crucial for the linear combination of a1. Hence, we conclude that this coefficient for a1 is zero. Moreover, this then implies that the linear combination from above is much simpler. So you see, now only the v vectors are involved here. However, for them we already know that they are linearly independent. So in conclusion, we have that all the coefficients have to be zero. And in summary, this means that our set C is also linearly independent. Therefore, the last thing to show here is that C also spans the whole subspace U. And in order to show this, I would say, let's choose an arbitrary vector U in our subspace. And there we can use that B is a basis, which means it spans the vector space U. So there are coefficients, which I now call mu1 to mu k. And there you see, the only thing we have to change here is now that we have to get rid of vj in the middle. So you know, instead of our vj, we now want our a1 here. However, this is not a problem at all, if you recall our formula for vj from above. This means that we can simply substitute vj here on the right hand side. And what we get is just a linear combination with the remaining v's and a1. Of course, it's not important to know how we can calculate all the coefficients, it's just important that we have them. Therefore, I call them mu tilde here. Okay, and with this you should see we have it. Each vector u in u, we can span with our vectors from c. So in conclusion, we have shown that c is also a basis. And that's the whole proof of Steinitz exchange lemma for the case that l is equal to 1. Now, if l is bigger than 1, you have to exchange more vectors than just 1, but you can reuse a lot of these arguments here. Okay, the important thing is it works and we can conclude that the number of basis elements in a basis for a vector space u is fixed. And this will help us in the next video when we talk about the notion of the dimension of a subspace. Therefore, I really hope that we meet there again and have a nice day. Bye.